So now we're going to go on to a briefing on the point in time count from the Ending Community Homelessness Coalition, ECHO. And um, we'll invite Mr. Malika to the podium. Yeah. Good morning, Chair, Council Members. We're excited to be here today to provide this briefing. Um, we're fortunate to have such a robust sort of evaluation of our point in time count. We're excited to show you the data, to answer any questions you might have, and to make sure that we uh, leave today with a good understanding of what the point in time count is and how it relates to the rest of our data sources that we have access to here uh, within Austin Travis County. Um, today with me is our Director of Research and Evaluation, uh, Akram Al-Turk, and our Manager of Research and Evaluation, Claire Burris, and they're going to give the presentation and will be available for, for questions afterwards. Do you mind if we pull up another chair to this and present from here? Is that all right? And as you get settled, um, colleagues, I know many of us have participated in the point in time count, and it's a, it's a very unique and insightful way to participate and I want to thank all the volunteers. I know it takes hundreds of volunteers throughout our city to, to help fulfill and uh, perform the count. So it's an incredible effort. Yeah, I wanted to make sure before I left the podium that I thanked all the council members involved because we did. We have great council turnout. We have awesome turnout from our county commissioners, many of our state representatives, of course, our mayor. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate for that kind of support and great volunteers throughout the uh, Central Texas. So thank you for that reminder. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction and thank you to the Public Health Committee members for being here. So just a brief overview of what Akram and I will be discussing if today. you would mind stating your name. Yes, my name is Claire Burris and I'm Research and Evaluation Manager with ECHO. Brief outline of what we will be presenting today um, is on the screen. First, we will be starting with our point in time count estimates, uh, the actual numbers, the, the data that, that has been uh, long awaited. Then we will go into a discussion of the geography of unsheltered homelessness and how things have changed since the most recent count that we conducted prior to this year's in 2020. Then we will speak a little bit about what some of the subpopulations are, um, some demographics and uh, key population groups within uh, our homeless community. And we will wrap up with a discussion of how we're responding to the homelessness crisis as a homelessness response system in Austin and Travis County. So to start us off here, our 2023 point in time count revealed 2,374 total people experiencing homelessness using the point in time count methodology. 1,266 of those individuals were identified sleeping unsheltered or in places not meant for human habitation. So this includes uh, on the street, in encampments, in cars, uh, under roadways, et cetera. And 1,108 of those individuals were identified as sleeping in our shelter system. So the point in time count in 2023 took place on um, the early morning hours of January 28th uh, in the entirety of the geographic region of Travis County and Austin. It is important to note before we move into the next slide uh, that we did not conduct a uh, unsheltered point in time counts in 2021 or in 2022 due to COVID-19, but uh, that this year we did have a tremendous um, participation from our Austin community uh, to get out there and really do our best as a community effort to count as many folks as we possibly could. And we had over 700 volunteers participate and we're very grateful to the Austin community for that. So here you'll see again that um, 
a couple years are missing from this graphic. That is because we did not conduct a point in time count in 2021 or 2022 due to COVID-19. But looking back in the point count uh, point in time count data that we do have since 2017, you'll see that generally there is a uh, slight uh, increase over time. And that in 2020, we really had an exceptional year with a disproportionate proportion uh, of folks counted unsheltered as opposed to sheltered, and overall a larger number of folks counted in 2020. But we show this to show more of a general trend over time as opposed to just comparing to 2020 because this larger time frame really shows a clearer story of what's going on in our community. A really important finding from this year's count is that the geographic distribution of where unsheltered folks are located has spread out from the city center since 2020. So here with this heat map, you can see that although there is still a concentration of folks right around the Austin uh, downtown core, that there is a larger spread uh, of folks also identified in North Austin, Southwest Austin, um, in, it, there's just a higher concentration of folks farther from the city core. Here we have mapped out the 2023 count by city council district and have also shown in the table to the right how things have changed between 2020 to 2023 with the percent change of the proportion of individuals counted in the unsheltered population by city council district. So you'll see that the highest concentration of folks is uh, have been located in District 9, both in 2020 and 2023. Um, as we all know, District 9 encompasses a good amount of Central Austin. And so that's consistent with the heat map on the prior slide. But I think it is really important to note how uh, geographic distribution has affected the proportion of folks in uh, each city council district and how that change um, really looks at the, at the district level. So you'll see here, for example, uh, city council district five had, a, had the largest percent increase of folks identified between 2020 and 2023. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit into where some of these areas are that people have moved into. Um, and hopefully reveal a little bit more of why that could be the case. Um, but this shows some pretty clear insights uh, that just looking at the proportion within each district doesn't tell the full story of how things are changing in a dynamic way in the community. So one of the things that we looked into in our analysis this year is the geographic distribution of folks that are located in city-owned, uh, City of Austin-owned parks, nature preserves, and green belts using City of Austin uh, public data on the geographic regions that are covered. And in 2020, uh, about 5.2% of unsheltered individuals were counted in these regions. And in 2023, that number increased to 13.6%. So we're seeing that um, although the number of individuals that we counted in the 2023 point in time count is slightly smaller than in the 2020 count, a larger concentration of the individuals counted are um, are sleeping unsheltered in park lands and areas owned by the city of Austin. So just really to break down that difference, uh, as a proportion of all unsheltered homelessness, about three times as many people were living specifically in the city of Austin owned green belts and nature preserves and parks in 2023 versus 2020. So some of the key takeaways here when it comes to this mapping analysis is that uh, in 2023, we had a smaller proportion of people counted in the central parts of Austin. City Council Districts 3 and 9 saw the largest percent decrease 
in the number of people counted and city council districts one, five, and six saw the largest percent increase in the number of people counted. Also important to note yet again here that a larger proportion of unsheltered folks were living in secluded areas um, like city owned green belts and nature preserves in 2023 versus 2020. Just a note here to the side, um, in 2020, there are about 34% of people counted in those central pit sections uh, versus 27% in 2023. So still a concentration of folks in the city core, but not to the same extent that it once was. So honing in here, not just on geographic differences, but um, more broadly looking at subpopulations and demographics, um, there are a few key differences to note uh, in how things have changed from 2020 to 2023. So for age, a smaller percentage of people in this year's count were under the age of 25 relative to 2020. A smaller percentage of people were under the age of 18 in 2023 versus 2020. And a smaller percentage of people counted were considered unaccompanied youth in 2023. So we're seeing um, a decrease in homelessness within our youth populations. A higher percentage of males were counted in 2023 versus 2020. We have always seen a slightly disproportionate representation of men and boys in our population experiencing homelessness, uh, and that seems to be slightly exacerbated in this year's count. As for race and ethnicity, um, there is a disproportionate number of members of the black community that are experiencing homelessness in Austin and Travis County. However, it seems that the percentage that that group comprises has uh, decreased slightly from 2020 to 2023. We are seeing uh, in turn a larger percentage of Hispanic and Latinx people counted in our population experiencing homelessness since 2020 and a larger proportion of Asians and Native Americans. Um, that proportion has doubled from 2020 to 2023, although it still comprises a very um, small minority of the overall population. We're also seeing a slightly smaller percentage of veterans counted in 2023 relative to 2020, but hovering around approximately 10% of the overall population counted. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, council members, for having us today to present on PIT data. My name is Akram Al Turk. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation at ECHO. I'm going to present a couple more things about the point in time count and then shift a little bit to some other data that we have that we wanted to, to show you all. Um, another question that volunteers asked during the unsheltered count is whether this was someone's first time experiencing homelessness. So as you can see here from this chart, about 42% of people on that night said that this was their first time experiencing homelessness. Volunteers also asked people whether they, where they first experienced homelessness. So as you can see here, almost three out of four people, or about 75% of those who were unsheltered in Austin, first experienced unsheltered homelessness in Austin. Another one in six, 16% first experienced their homelessness in Texas, but outside of Austin. And then the remaining first experienced homelessness outside of Texas. Chair? Chair? I wanna, oh. Can I ask a question sorry. right quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, we hear kind of, I think, anecdotally that like, you know, Waco sends all their, you know what I mean, that this kind of like, that, that Texas in general and that other cities will kind of ship their uh, homeless folks uh, to us with a bus ticket and like, you know what I mean, 50 bucks or something like that. Uh, this would tend to suggest otherwise. Any kind of other kind of thoughts on, on that? I mean, my sense would be that it's, we have a native homeless problem 
Is that what the, the data shows? Yes, I think that's exactly what the data shows. I think it would dispel some of those myths uh, that we hear often. And, and one of the other things, as you can see from this slide, is that that number has actually gone up, uh, the number of people who first experienced homelessness in Austin. Um, in 2020, in the, in the unsheltered count, it was 63% of folks were said that they were first, first experienced homelessness in Austin. In 2023, that number increased to 75% almost. So that's a, almost an 11 percentage point increase um, in the last three years. So is there any data or information that would suggest otherwise? I would suggest, again, setting aside the kind of anecdotes and the kind of, you know, stories that you hear that people are intentionally, you know, being sent to Austin or that, you know, for whatever reason kind of come to Austin, that there's some kind of like a magnet effect or anything like that? Not that I know. And in fact, our administrative data shows something very similar to what the PIT data shows. We ask on the coordinated assessment, which is our centralized prioritization tool, um, where people experience their home, first homelessness or first um, experience of homelessness. Or, sorry, we asked a, we asked a different question on, on the coordinated assessment. We asked people where they last were permanently housed. And a majority of folks say that they were housed last in Austin. And so okay. that's another piece of data that would confirm what we're seeing here with the point in time count. And data. that question is part of uh, the, the, the coordinated assessment when we all take them and, and, and put them on the list and stuff? Correct. Right, on the by name list. That's All right. right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, no problem, Council Member. Um, the other thing, the other takeaway here is that um, in 2020, about 40% of those who were unsheltered, 39% um, were homeless for the first time. In 2023, that number increased to 42%. So again, and uh, I think the key takeaways from this slide is that the number of people who are experiencing homelessness for the first time has gone up, and the number of people who experienced their first experience of homelessness in Austin um, has also gone up. So now that we've presented data from the point in time count, um, you know, we want to shift a little bit to present data, you know, supplementary and alternative uh, data sources that we think complement um, and help us better understand the scope of homelessness. Um, in the full, th this is a condensed uh, slide deck, but in the full slide deck that we presented a couple weeks ago that's on our website, we do talk about the limitations of the point in time count, and we, we're happy to address those in the Q&A. Um, but because there are limitations to the point in time count, the unsheltered count, um, we think it's important to present some of this alternative data. And so we do have supplementary data from the Travis County Sheriff's Office. Um, and here, one of the, 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 the main takeaway here, or the, the main piece of information that we have is that on that night, there were 700 individuals, about 700 individuals in Travis County Jail, uh, likely to be experiencing homelessness. Um, these folks would not have been counted in the pit, in the point in time count. Um, the, these 700 individuals accounted for 31% of the total population in the jail that night. And uh, from speaking to the sheriff's office, this is the highest percentage that they've seen in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, of the 699 individuals, 67% were people of color, 86% were males, and 50% were between the ages of 17 and 36. So here I think the one takeaway from, from these uh, data are that um, people experiencing homelessness in jail are more likely to be male than the general population experiencing homelessness, and they're more likely to be younger than the general population experiencing homelessness. So again, be because of the limitations of the pit count, we have for the last two years been measuring the prevalence of homelessness using administrative data, and we've been updating that data on a monthly basis. We count people who take the coordinated assessment which is our local housing prioritization tool, who report living unsheltered and who have had any interaction in the, in the homelessness response system in the previous six months. For us, this estimate better reflects the true scope of homelessness in, in Austin Travis County, and because we have much more detailed information in our administrative data, we're able to address people's needs in a more, much more targeted way. 
So if you're interested in seeing what our dashboard estimates show and learn more about the differences, which I know you all have, have discussed, uh, here are some links that might be helpful. Now we're going to shift a little bit to showing some data that helps us understand how the many service providers in the homelessness response system are addressing homelessness in our community. Two important, important pieces of information allow us to do that are how many people exit homelessness to permanent housing and what is the capacity in our system to house people. So we'll start with the former. And, and in this figure, what, you, what you'll see is that you'll see the number of people who, by year, who exit and move into permanent housing, who exit homelessness into permanent housing. So one main takeaway from this is that there's been a general upward trend of the, um, that we're seeing here of the number of people who are exiting homelessness to permanent housing. So I'll, I'll focus on 2022. Uh, 788 people in 2022 required minimal housing assistance to move into permanent housing. This means that they were provided services or, or stayed in a shelter and were then able to move into permanent housing on their own. And then those represented by the orange or purple bars were able to, um, were provided more intensive permanent housing support by the system. So one thing to note here is that more people moved into permanent supportive housing, that those 241 folks in the orange bar, than in any other year that we've, that we've been tracking this. Um, Move-ins into rapid rehousing did go down in 2022, but we anticipate with new rapid rehousing resources coming online at the end of 2022 and, and 2023 that that number should go back up. We also often get asked about our capacity you know, to, to house people, how many units do we have in the system to house people, and, and this figure shows that capacity. Uh, again, the general trend is that the system's capacity, which reflects new resources in the community, has increased in recent years. Uh, this is notable with our, this is most notable with our capacity to house people in permanent supportive housing, uh, which is a, as you know, is a critical intervention that supports those with the most acute needs in the community and those who have been chronically homeless. <clears throat> And, and one of the, th I'll, I'll point this out, so the, the orange bar here is the, our permanent supportive housing capacity. As you can see, it has gone up considerably in the last few years, and, and, and that is a, is, is a positive trend. Uh, one thing to note here is that our rapid rehousing capacity number, which is shown in purple, has gone down, um, but as per HUD requirements, um, the reason for that is that this shows us the number of people who were actually housed in rapid rehousing in the night of, uh, of the pit count. Um, in reality, the system's capacity to house people in rapid, re rapid rehousing is more than double what is shown here. Um, and so because a number of rapid rehousing projects are relatively new, people housed in rapid rehousing should go up throughout, throughout this coming year. So to summarize the key takeaways about our system um, and our, our efforts to address homelessness is that more people exited in 2022 than in any other year, especially in permanent supportive housing. The system's capacity to house people in PSH has increased 60% almost since 2019 and 14% in the last year. So the system's emergency shelter capacity has increased 28% since 2019 and 20% in the last year. So wrapping up, we just want to discuss one more piece of data that makes us more optimistic that our capacity to house those most in need uh, will increase in the coming years as a result of more resources in the community, especially ones dedicated to capital projects. We anticipate more site-based PSH coming online in the next three years. In contrast to tenant-based PSH, site-based PSH, as the name implies, are units dedicated to PSH units, housing, and wraparound services at one site, providing people exiting homelessness with community and with, with, and with ready access to the services that they need. We anticipate more than 1,000 of these units uh, will be available by the, end of, by the end of 2025, and approximately a quarter to a third of those will hopefully be ready by the end of this year. So again, as, as we mentioned earlier, we really want to thank uh, all the more than 
700 volunteers who helped make the unsheltered count possible. Uh, as you all know, this is a massive undertaking and collecting pit data could not be possible and would not be possible without all of the volunteers who came out, not just to count, but to make care kits, lead teams, section uh, teams, um, and then and actually count people. <clears throat> and I think that's it, and we will. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Colleagues, questions? Who'd like to kick us off? Well, thank you for letting me join you today, and thank you all for all the data. And, and it's, when I talk to people, whether it's District 5 or throughout the city, you know, I, I tell them homelessness is the hardest challenge that we face. There's so many facets of, of this challenge and, and the unique needs of every individual who's out there. There's no one solution, and that's what makes this so difficult. Of course, housing is a big piece of it, but even as you saw and, and you know, looking at your data, you know, about 8% of people we put in housing do end up back on the streets. So it's, there is no panacea. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit where Councilman Ravela left off, and it's on the, the regionality of our homeless population. And, you know, I was looking at Williamson County's point in time count. And their number for a county that's half the size of Travis County, they counted 96 people. And that's 4% of what our count is. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, I have trouble believing that they're, that only four, you know, that uh, such a small fraction of the homeless population we have here is not in part due to, you know, someone, let's say, in Round Rock or um, even Georgetown who service provider, well, a lack of service providers in those communities they do say, hey, if you want to get the services, the city of Austin is, is probably your best bet. And so while when we ask somebody where they first experienced homelessness, they say Austin, but really that could mean any of the surrounding Austin area. And, and the only reason I bring that up is to figure out how we better coordinate with our surrounding communities, whether it's cities like Cedar Park, Round Rock, Georgetown, Bastrop, but also our surrounding counties. And I know we've had conversations about that. So is there anything we can do to help those coordination efforts? Because if, if we are able to identify and, and serve individuals where they are, I think we'll be more successful. Sorry, thank you, Council Member, for that question. I think, um, like many issues, um, homelessness is definitely been solved at, as, at a regional level. I mean, we're definitely seeing, um, you know, in most large uh, communities across the country that have large populations of people experiencing homelessness, whether that be on the West Coast um, or, you know, even in larger Texas cities. Um, certainly, when the region, when the area around the the very urban core of um, you know, of Austin starts to become unaffordable, you start to see your unsheltered population rise in, the, in communities. And so certainly, similar to transportation, I imagine, uh, food insecurity, these are best solved on a regional level. I think we've had, we've certainly worked with our partners in Williamson County on initiatives. Currently, ECHO's role um, as, a, as an organization is to serve Austin and Travis County. Um, I will say we have had conversations about what it would mean to expand the size of our geographic scope, so the, the, our, what's called our continuum of care to include um, other areas of Central Texas. Um, and those conversations, I think, are ongoing and support will be needed if there is a decision made to, to move in that direction because I think um, th there's a, a bit of a resource scarcity in those areas as well. or, or uh, a lack of a commitment to providing the type of resources necessary to solve homelessness in those communities. And so um, as those conversations progress and as we move um, hopefully towards a more regional approach, um, we'll certainly be, be calling on, on council, um, council members, 
uh, to help reach out and bridge um, both communication, build relationships, help to identify areas um, where there can be more and better coordination with those surrounding counties. Changing gears a little bit, looking at the that regional shift, obviously you mentioned District 5, 135% increase. I think if you talk to a lot of District 5 residents, they would agree and, and say that's exactly what we've seen. Do you have any anecdotal data otherwise, just why you think that area has, you know, I, if you look at your, your little heat map, it's pretty centered around, um, you know, Ben White, Westgate, Menchaca area. Um, any, uh, any guess or, or just thought of why that is? I mean, anecdotally, I'll, I mean, I can say just, you know, we're seeing higher rates of criminalization in our central core downtown area, and I think folks are um, leaving that area, those areas. Um, we certainly saw a little bit of that up in District 4 as well, and, you know, the 183 um, sort of area there, and I think we've dealt with that where we're hearing anecdotally from neighborhood associations um, and other community partners that they're seeing folks in uh, more uh, neighborhood um, parts of the, the the city than than before, and I think that the data play, uh, is clearly demonstrating that that we have. And anecdotally, I think just in talking to community members, we're hearing the same thing. It raises the question in my mind of the the most effective way and if to to help serve those who are unhoused is a is a wide geographic dispersion better or concentrations better so we can focus resources how do we think about how we can most effectively i mean obviously the most effective thing is to to not have the population all have them in housing but as we try to get there how what do we want that map to look like yeah, I mean, I think to your to your first point, we don't want there to be any data points on that map. Um, and so, as we work towards that as a community, um, I think we know that that concentrations of people experiencing homelessness are it is traumatic for folks to be in and around uh, a large concentration of folks experiencing homelessness. And so, that has played out, I think, across the country in a lot of different ways. And so. I think delivering services, um, whether it be housing services, emergency services, such as emergency shelter, um, or outreach to folks, is best done in the in the places that they're at, and not ask them to move to other places to, to get that resource. And so, to the best we can, deliver the resources that folks are asking us for in the sites that they're at is the most effective and sort of trauma informed way to approach um, to approach getting uh, people that, the help that they need. And to that point, you know, District 5 has uh, a provider, Sunrise, who does navigation services, day center services. Are those services being offered really anywhere else in the city? Do you know? Yeah, so we definitely have those services offered in, in different parts of the city. Sunrise, um, is a great partner, um, really um, has done a wonderful job of, um, of providing uh, access to the homelessness response system from their site. And so that's a really key aspect is that they're not just providing emergency services at, at Sunrise. They're also providing access to these housing resources that are coming online by doing coordinated assessments. They're, they're connecting folks to benefits. They're, um, and, and they're doing a, a lot of great work for, from that perspective. Thus, I think they see a lot of folks coming to them for, for those services because they're able to connect folks to the system. We definitely have people doing that great work in other parts of the city. The Austin Street Outreach Collaborative, which was formed um, about a year ago with a very generous um, grant from the St. David's Foundation, um, has uh, uh, outreach and engagement um, happening in, in many different parts of the community, including much of the Eastern Crescent area, um, parts of North, uh, Northeast Austin, 
and centrally downtown through partners like Urban Alchemy and We Can Now. And so those services are offered in other places as well. Um, of course, we have um, city-funded programs through Integral Care, like the host, the host team and the PATH team also doing, um, you know, doing that work and providing those types of services there. Um, I would say that the one thing that's unique, very unique about Sunrise is that it's a site-specific service. And so, yes, that, that you know, the other services tend to be more um, mobile. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I know I've, we've talked a bit about uh, with members of, uh, on the dais. And, and I think as we approach this budget and as we approach the larger conversation, we need to find more spaces throughout the city that are site specific where individuals can come and it's, it's a real chicken and egg problem because on the one hand, I can completely understand communities who say, you know, if you locate this here, it's going to be a, a strain on our community. On the other hand, until we have many of them, that can be the case. But if you have 300 people at a site every day because we have one of them or if we have 10 of them and it's 25 or 30 people, that's a very manageable traffic that, that really doesn't have an impact on you know, the broader community, but those that it's serving has a huge impact. And so how we can find areas dispersed through the city, I think is one of our greatest challenges and shortcomings and something that I'm gonna be pushing for and, and um, I, I just see a, a huge, huge need. So that's not really a question, but it's just a... Well, I think, Council Member, what I'd like to say, that I appreciate that that um, perspective and certainly the advocacy that that will take here on the dais and um, with your colleagues. Um, I think one of the things that's critically important to, um, to, to the system as a whole is to ensure that folks don't have to continue to show up at that site in order to get housed. And so I think that the more housing we can bring online, the more, the more options we can provide folks for permanent housing options will ensure that those sites can stay at 25 or 30 folks. Because I can tell you that long ago, that's how Sunrise started. That was not the volume of folks showing up for the services there. Uh, and so if we can manage to create a system where folks have geographic options as to where they can go for, for, for services to get housed, and then we have housing and the throughput there, then they're only there, temp they're only showing up temporarily, and we can keep the numbers of folks that need to access those types of services down in those areas. Yeah. That's all I have for now, but thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Ravello? Just to, actually, let me just start off with a, a quick comment. I, I participated in the in the point in time count uh, for the first time this year, uh, and it was a, a very eye opening experience. Uh, definitely the, the the most and longest personal interactions that you know I've had with uh, with folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, and again, like just about anything. Uh, it changes your perception of uh, people, uh, and it, I look forward to it again. But again, it was a very eye-opening, very uh, revealing uh, time. Um, you know, with and I just wanted to get y'all's uh, uh, you know perspectives on on this uh, kind of you know, I guess tension or trade-off that that we're you know looking at right now, uh, the balance between funding emergency shelter and funding uh, permanently supportive housing. Uh, that's always kind of been a, a, a struggle, I mean, which one is uh, the priority, where do we uh, invest our, our limited dollars. Um, over the last you know, year and a half or so that I've been on council, I, I just, I'll give you my a point of view and then I'd like to hear y'all's. Uh, my sense is that the less time that people spend fully unsheltered, you know, living in the creek or in, you know, under the bridge or something like that, that just seems to be very bad for people. Uh, and I feel like you see people really kind of descend, you know, both from a mental and physical uh, uh, standpoint. Whereas 
emergency shelter for its you know limitations set, seems to stabilize uh, folks and kind of let them kind of catch their breath and open the door to you know services, case management, those kinds of things like that. Um, so uh, again, I, I don't want to, but my sense is that emergency shelter is important in. Uh, kind of building and pulling people, that first step of, uh, of pulling people out of uh, uh, homelessness and kind of preparing them to a certain extent for permanently supportive housing from a situation where they may have been, you know, just uh, uh, you know, zero expectations, you know, very, very, you know, zero rules, you know, it's kind of a good transition period. How do you all see it? You know, again, thinking about the opening of the marshalling yard, thinking about you know those kinds of steps like that, and the, and the amount of money that we're going to have to you know put into it. How how do you all see that that balance? Yeah. Um, so we've been living this tension right along with you all, council members. I appreciate the question, uh, Council Member Vela. So clearly, in our community, um, we there is a need for both more emergency shelter and for permanent supportive housing and both interventions. The need for emergency shelter is exacerbated and highlighted by the, um, by the ordinances we have criminalizing homelessness in our community. And so when we have people who are facing, um, you know, we saw, you saw the data about the Travis County Jail folks, more than almost 700 people, that's a failure on um, our system that we had 700 folks in the Travis County Jail the night of the point in time count that came in reported experiencing homelessness. So for those 700 folks, if you had asked them, would, would it be better to go to an emergency shelter or to a jail, and they had a choice about that, I'm certain that they would, they would choose the emergency shelter option. What I'll say is, in communities across the country that have not invested in permanent supportive housing to the scale that they need to, people see very long stays in emergency shelter, and ultimately you see folks getting frustrated with emergency shelter and going back to the street. Um, emergency shelter, especially congregate emergency shelter, is not the solution for uh, that many people desire uh, to end their homelessness. We, we know that both anecdotally and through the data. Um, some of the data that wasn't presented today showed that on the pit count night that our emergency shelters had a 70% utilization rate. So you had 30% open beds in the emergency shelter system at the height of some pretty aggressive criminalization happening. And quite frankly, if those of you that are out there on that night know it was raining and cold. And so if that's the case, and looking at scaling up more congregate emergency shelter, um, there really needs to be a, a, an important investigation and sort of audit around what types of shelter we're providing to folks and what, um, you know, how we're meeting the needs of people and are, are they going to want to stay there? And is there, um, is it delivering the type of service? Are they getting housing from going into that shelter? Um, are they being moved through the shelter and, um, and into more permanent housing options is key. I, I want to say this too and make really clear. We have one of the lowest rates of permanent supportive housing uh, resources of any community of our size in the country. It's not even close. Um, and we need to build out permanent supportive housing capacity. It needs to be a priority, and that's a hard thing to do in um, you know, a very hyper-political environment such as this because it takes time. Um, this year, you saw the slide. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna have ribbon cuttings on close to 500, 400 plus units of permanent supportive housing. That didn't happen this year. Um, that's been years and years in the making. Leadership like the Homeless Strategy Office, um, certainly Diana, has been critical, critical in continuing the charge on building permanent supportive housing in that community, in this community. And without that investment and without that um, leadership, um, our emergency shelter system will um, not function well. And so. We need to continue that investment. And so when we ask, like, where should the money go? Should it go here or there? It really needs to go to fund the entire continuum of services for people experiencing homelessness. That includes emergency shelter, but it's not exclusive to that. And that includes a permanent housing option because the folks that we house permanently in our community will not come back at, at rates that are high to our shelter system or to our streets. And that's the end goal, the lasting solution to ending homelessness in our community. 
everything else is just you know squeezing air in a balloon back and forth. We're moving folks around. We're moving them into shelter. They're coming back to the street. Um, we need more permanent supportive housing. So it can not be an either or scenario, um, and we need to see greater investments in permanent supportive housing. I just want to add a little bit uh, to follow up on Matt's point. I think we, we certainly need a little bit of both, or we need both emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. I think that the, the thing that, one of the things that Matt pointed out is talk, thinking about long-term impact and the long-term outcomes. Uh, and the research shows across the country, but also here locally, that the outcomes for folks who are in permanent supportive housing, who are in, who have rapid rehousing resources as well, is better in the long run than if they just stay in emergency shelter. Now, I, so I, th I think that if we pair emergency shelter with rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing, that is a, you know, I think that's a, a good um, approach. But I, again, I just, especially given that we have a high number of people here in Austin, Travis County, experiencing chronic homelessness, we have a, the, the rate of chronicity here in our, in our community is higher than it is in many other uh, communities. And because of that, I think we need services and interventions that provide wraparound services, which is what permanent supportive housing provides. And so um, I think that's another uh, reason that we, we really need to, to increase our capacity for PSH. Um, you know, well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I know this predated my uh, time uh, on council, but I know there was a debate about uh, kind of a legal campsite that the city would, you know, open and run possibly multiple. And uh, I, I remember um, uh, uh, Dana Gray discussing that trade-off, you know, where it's really expensive and, and difficult to get something like that set up. And, you know, maybe we want to, uh, you know, focus more on the permanently supportive housing. And I can say, I completely understand that. I, I will say just as someone who's out in the community all the time, you know, talking to people, talking to constituents who, you know, they, they want people on the streets. You know, I mean, just in, in a very, like, from, from multiple perspectives, you know, both from a hostile perspective and from a very caring, uh, you know, perspective, it, you know, I, I, there's multiple people that I talk to that are, you know, as bleeding heart liberals as, as bleeding heart liberals can get. And uh, it just breaks their heart to see, you know, people in these conditions every day. And it just throws off their kind of, you know, their mental and kind of, you know, spiritual uh, uh, place, you know, and, and that seeing people struggling like that all the time is, is, is very difficult for a lot of members uh, of our community. Um, but I, I do uh, appreciate the, 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 the balance and, and the trade-offs that y'all are talking about. A couple of other uh, just uh, uh, follow-ups. On the uh, it's the coordinated assessment is essentially the, the what the echo uh, maintains or kind of uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about that I've heard people talk about it I, I've never you know 100% kind of heard it explained exactly what it is you know how it came about those kinds of things like that sure so the coordinated assessment is the intake tool uh, that is used to prioritize folks experiencing homelessness for permanent housing opportunities as they open in our community. So the coordinated assessment is one element of what we call the coordinated entry system. So when someone is experiencing homelessness in the community, uh, we as a homelessness response system make our best attempt to uh, get them to the front door of our system for housing. And that front door is coordinated entry. Mm -hmm. So when somebody goes through the coordinated entry process, they will be screened for, um, you know, wh whether diversion might be an option for them. Diversion is uh, a, basically a way for us to reconnect someone to housing um, using much lower level of resources. Usually this is only a sustainable option if the person is uh, not long-term chronically homeless, um, but maybe has been experiencing homelessness for a very short period of time. So we do that screening, uh, and then if the person is, is unable or ineligible really for diversion, then we go through our coordinated assessment process. There's also a housing choice component to our coordinated entry system where we 
speak with people about what types of programs they might be interested in and what might be a good fit for them based on lots of components of eligibility and what their history and identity and experience is. Um, so our coordinated assessment here locally um, is something that we have spent a lot of time and energy on developing. Um, there are a lot of tools out there that can be used as an intake tool, but we um, have chosen to locally develop a tool that is specific to the needs and experiences of people here in our uh, community experiencing homelessness. Um, so it, it's a prioritization tool uh, in general, higher prioritization um, score results in a quicker uh, connection to permanent housing resources as they open. But I think to tie it back to some of uh, uh, other topics we've been discussing, an expansion of those permanent housing resources allows us to keep up with the rate of people inflowing to homelessness. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're at a point where our system with the capacity that we have, even though we have been making tremendous strides to increase the capacity so that people can be connected to those resources more quickly, we can't keep up with the inflow right now. Um, emergency shelter, although it may um, very well improve health outcomes and stability for folks, is not going to decrease homelessness. And so I think that's um, really, really key in the conversation um, for us to consider uh, about how we can get people connected to permanent housing more quickly. So from, from Echo's perspective then, we are still net adding uh, numbers to our overall homelessness count. In, in other words, we've got more people new to the system than are, you know, exiting the system. Yeah, I think that's that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one, one thing to mention about the coordinated assessment, council member, it's a great question, is it's a scarcity tool um, that we're using that HUD requires us to use. I mean, we, we don't, we would love to get to a point where we don't have to do coordinated assessments with anyone because really what that says is we have too many people for too few a resource, so we're gonna prioritize which folks are the sickest on the street to try to get them housed before they die. Mm -hmm. uh, and about how many folks, and, and let me actually back up just a second. So would most uh, people experiencing homelessness on the street right now be in the uh, coordinated uh, entry system? So that's a really good question. I think I'm gonna let Akram or Claire take that, but I, but I think one thing that our data is showing us is that we have, and similar to what happens at the point in time count, when you have more data collectors, you start to get more data. And what we're seeing in our, um, in our administrative data that's on our dashboards is the number of people experiencing homelessness is increasing month over month. So we do monthly counts of unsheltered homelessness. Mm -hmm. But that has some to do with closing the delta between known and unknown homelessness because we have more data collectors out there doing coordinated assessments. Mm -hmm. Um, You're more and, effectively counting them, basically. Exactly. Uh, now, that's not the only impact. I'll say that there's certainly, as you saw from the data that Akram presented, we have more people experiencing first-time homelessness at a high rate, too. So I don't know, Akram or Claire, if you have anything to add. And as you all add to it, I just want to flag this will probably be our last question because we do okay. need to move on to the next briefing. Thank you. Yeah, I, my, my first thought, which Matt essentially said, is we don't know what we don't know about people who are not in our coordinated entry system and are not engaging with services in our community. Um, our best estimate for the need of folks who are in our coordinated entry system and are still awaiting permanent housing uh, placement is our dashboard estimate for the number of people experiencing homelessness. Final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would like to just quickly say thank you, Chair, for, for that opportunity. Um, you know, as we sit here and we talk about something that I think has become really political in nature uh, here in Austin, Travis County, and quite frankly, across the country, I want to make it really clear that from a political standpoint, no matter what um, political party you identify with, over the last 15 to 20 years, we've failed to do much make much progress on ending homelessness in our community. We've had failed policies on the federal level going back multiple administrations throughout time. 
We've seen state governments take this up in ways that are not helpful or impactful. And we've seen the you know, city governments really step in, local city governments, to support the homelessness response system in ways that that's never been the case uh, before. And I want to commend this city um, and certainly this council and previous councils who have stepped in to make investments in this area that are going to be critical to the long-term success of ending homelessness in Austin Travis County. Now, that's the piece of this, and Councilmember Vela mentioned it. This is a long game right now. This is, a, this is something that we're going to work on and have to make investments that we're not going to see right away, but there's things that we can do to manage public spaces better to help with the community members that are concerned about the folks that they're seeing on the street, because everybody's uh, concerned about that. So I do want to make sure that we're, that we're, we're keeping our, uh, you know, we're doing the best to keep our eye on the long game while addressing the public space issues. And lastly, um, I want to make something really clear. You know, I've been working here since the beginning and the, of the creation of the Homeless Strategy Office here. Um, and we had an initial Homeless Strategy Officer who didn't last very long in that position. Um, we've uh, had Diana in her role for a period of time, and she's built out a team. Um, and that team is work, working extremely well and hard with our community members, not just our service providers, not just ECHO, but with people experiencing homelessness in our community. The work that Diana's done and her team has been exemplary. Um, she's been a wonderful partner and someone that I think we where we wouldn't be where we are right now in this community without her leadership and the dedication that she's shown year over year, night after night, having difficult conversations, showing up in spaces where she's not the most popular person in the room. I know we all know what that's like. And, and standing her ground on on uh, delivering what she thinks and what we all know is best for this community in, in her role. So I want to just make sure that we say, as a partner, ECHO has been really fortunate to have the Homeless Strategy Office in the role that they're playing, and we really appreciate the, the support that Council's provided her, so thank you.